Sam's Bumper Jumper. In Ponty Pandy High Street, there's a small cafe owned by a very nice Italian lady called Bella. Bella is good and kind and loves doing things for other people. Today, she's knitting a jumper for Fireman Sam. It's a going to be a big surprise for Sam, she said to Rosa, her little furry kitten. Ding, went the doorbell as someone came into the cafe. Bella put down her knitting and went out to serve the customer. It was Elvis Cridlington. Tea and toast, please, Bella, he said. Bella made the tea and toast, put them on Elvis's table, and went back into the parlor to carry on knitting. Now let me see, she said. Where was I up to? She had forgotten how many rows she had done. Was it a 52 or a 25, she wondered. I'd better be on the safer side, she said to Rosa, and call it a 25. She started knitting ferociously, her needles a positive blur. But then, ding! Another customer had come into the cafe. Bella sighed and put down the knitting. I'll never get it finished at this rate, she sighed. This time, it was Trevor Evans. He sat down at the table with Elvis and asked Bella for toasted tea cakes and hot chocolate. When Bella had made Trevor's snack, she went back into the parlor to knit some more of Sam's jumper. Disaster had struck the woolly jumper. Mama mia, shouted Bella. You are not the pussycat. Rosa was rolled up in a huge, tangled pile of wool. She was looking very guilty indeed. Bella picked up the remains of the jumper and tried to untangle it. What am I going to do with this? She thought. It didn't take long to untangle the wool and roll it back into balls. But then... Mamma mia! She sighed. Where was I up to? Was it a 82 or a 28? I'd bet to be on the safer side, she said to Rosa, and call it a 28. Her needles flew into action, and Sam's woolly jumper started to grow. <whistles> Bella had just put the very last stitch in the jumper when the cafe bell rang. Bella bustled out to see who had come into the cafe this time. It was Fireman Sam with Sarah and James. Ah, oh, Carmilla, said Bella with a great big smile. It's uh, my two favorite children. She gave them a big hug and then turned to Sam. And uh, my favorite fireman. I have something extra special for you, Sam. Sam backed away nervously, thinking that Bella was going to give him a big hug too. But it was something entirely different. <whistles> Bella rushed into the parlor and came out carrying a huge parcel which she handed to Sam. It's uh, for you, she said with a smile. What is it, Uncle? asked James as Sam took the parcel from Bella. Please open it quickly, Uncle Sam, begged Sarah and see what is inside. Sam quickly stripped away the paper and pulled out the woolly jumper. Oh, it's beautiful, gasped Sarah. Try it on right away, Uncle Sam. Sam pulled the jumper over his head and everyone stared in amazement. I think it might be just a little bit biggish, said James finally. Mamma mia! wailed Bella. What have I done? Who did you use as a pattern, Bella? asked Elvis Cridlington. King Kong? Don't be cruel, Elvis, snapped Sarah. It's a very nice jumper. It's all my fault, said Bella sadly. I'm hopeless. 
she put her head in her hands and started to sob quietly. Don't cry, Bella, said Fireman Sam. I really like it. You do? asked Bella, brightening up a bit. But before Sam could answer, Station Officer Steele came into the cafe. What are you doing in that elephant rug, Sam? he asked. wailed Bella, tears pouring from her eyes like raindrops. I've said the wrong thing, haven't I? said Station Officer Steele as everyone glared at him. You certainly have, said Sarah sternly. That's Uncle Sam's new jumper knitted specially by Bella. Oh, gulped Steele. Sorry, Bella. Very nice. Roomy, too. Further conversation was stopped by a flash of lightning, followed immediately by a huge clap of thunder. <laughs> Sam almost jumped out of his jumper with fright. Then the telephone started to ring. <laughs> Bella picked up the telephone and listened for a second. It's a for you, she said, handing the receiver to Station Officer Steele. Steele listened intently, a grim look on his face. Don't worry, he said. We're on our way. What's happened, Mr. Steele? asked James. Lightning has struck the church spire, replied Steele, and it's beginning to burn. Let's go, men. The fireman rushed outside and jumped into Jupiter, the fire engine. Sam started the engine, and they roared off to deal with the emergency. Vicar was waiting anxiously for them, and as Jupiter screeched to a halt at the church, he pointed to the top of the church spire. The lightning had made a big hole just below the weathercock. The fire hose will be no use here, said Station Officer Steele. Someone will have to go up the ladder and put out the blaze with an extinguisher. I need a volunteer. It's a long way up, isn't it? said Elvis, looking at the top of the spire high above them. A very long way up, said Trevor Evans nervously. Well, naturally, I would go, said Steele, but as fire chief, I have to be in control here on the ground. I could go, I suppose, said Elvis, but my new shoes would be ruined. And I can't go up, said Trevor, because because he thought for a moment and then smiled because i want to give sam the opportunity to go up the ladder thanks very much said sam grumpily <whistles> sam picked up the fire extinguisher and started the long climb up the ladder it seemed to take ages to get to the top but finally he was able to look into the hole and see the fire I am going to put out the fire now, he shouted to the others on the ground. Lifting up the extinguisher, he pressed the button and a jet of foam shot out to smother the flames. The fire was quickly put out. Then, things started to go wrong. Sam was just about to climb down the ladder when a large bird flew down and perched on his nose. Ouch! yelled Sam as the bird's long talons gripped his nose firmly, bringing tears to his eyes. Get off my nose immediately! he shouted. But the bird had decided that Sam's nose made the perfect perch. It was not going to be moved off easily. The next thing to go wrong was that Sam accidentally dropped the fire extinguisher. I think Sam has dropped the fire extinguisher, said Elvis Cridlington, looking up. So he has, agreed Station Officer Steele. I think it's going to hit us, 
observed Trevor Evans. Hit us! they all shouted. Let's get out of here! They just managed to dive out of the way before the extinguisher hit the ground with a loud thump. Whoa! That was close, said Trevor. The others agreed. While they were talking, the ladder fell over. <laughs> Sam felt the ladder start to slip. Just in time, he managed to leap off and cling tightly to the weathercock. The bird on his nose decided that all this jumping about was too much trouble and flew away. Sam was very relieved about that. So was his nose. Then he looked down. Get me down from here! He yelled. The ladder is broken, said Trevor Evans, looking down at the shattered steps. That was the longest ladder in Ponty Pandy, said Station Officer Steele. We'll never get Sam down without it, added Elvis. They all looked up at Sam. Don't worry, Sam, shouted Station Officer Steele. We'll get you down. But how? asked Trevor Evans. How about the helicopter? suggested Elvis. A helicopter could pluck him to safety. You've been reading too many comics, said Station Officer Steele. Besides, the nearest helicopter base is miles away. No, we have to think of something simple. How about... began Trevor. No, that's no good either, snapped Steele impatiently. He could dive into a bucket of water, said Elvis. The others looked at him in amazement. I read about it once in a comic, admitted Elvis sheepishly. Why don't you catch him in a net? asked a strange voice from behind the hedge. It was the vicar. Of course, said Steele. Why didn't I think of that? Because you don't read the right kind of comics, muttered Elvis under his breath. What was that, Cridlington? snapped Station Officer Steele. Nothing, Chief. Nothing at all, replied Elvis innocently. Hmm, said Steele. Right, man, he ordered. Get the net. We haven't got one, said Trevor Evans. Haven't got one, echoed Steele. All firemen have a net. Well, we haven't, said Elvis. We used to have one. But it got used as a fish net when the canal bank burst and we had to rescue the fish. Then Trevor Evans had a brainwave. Wait here, he shouted, as he leapt into Jupiter and drove swiftly off, leaving Elvis and Steele standing by the church. Minutes later, he was back with Mrs. Price and Norman, Sarah and James, Bella and Sam's giant jumper. Everybody stand round the jumper and pull it tight, ordered Station Officer Steele. Right, Sam, he shouted to the tiny figure clinging desperately to the weathercock. Jump! Sam looked down at the scene below. It looked like a handful of ants holding a postage stamp. Jump! he shouted back. You must be joking! But at that moment, the large bird that had previously roosted on Sam's nose decided to give it another try. Sam saw the bird swooping down with talons extended and remembered the awful pain. Geronimo! He shouted as he leapt for his life. <whistles> Sam landed safely on the jumper and bounced to the ground. Looking at the stretched sweater, he said, It may not have been a very good jumper, Bella, but it's the best trampoline I have ever been on. When he hears the fire bell chime, Fireman Sam is there on time. Putting on his coat and hat, in less than seven.
Sam's Night Watch. Sarah and James were on their way to the park to play. Let's see if Uncle Sam wants to come with us, said Sarah. That's strange, said James, when they got to Sam's house. All the curtains are drawn. Puzzled, James knocked on the door. There was no answer. He was just going to knock again when Sarah stopped him. I've just remembered, she said. Uncle Sam is on night watch at the fire station this week, so he works at night and sleeps during the day. Oh, dear, said James. I hope we haven't woken him up. Shh, hissed Sarah as they tiptoed away. They did not have to worry, for upstairs in his bedroom, Sam was fast asleep. With the curtains drawn, the whole house was dark. Not a thing stirred. The only thing to be heard was the tick, tick, tick of the alarm clock by Sam's bed. The clock ticked happily to itself all day. Then suddenly, at five o'clock in the afternoon, it went off. Sam awoke with a start. Where's the fire? He cried, leaping out of bed. He felt very silly when he remembered where he was. Well, at least it got me up, he said sheepishly. Sam went downstairs to make his breakfast. I can never get used to having my breakfast at tea time, he said, pouring out a bowl of cornflakes. But that's what happens when you're on night watch. All your days are back to front. Sam got dressed and checked his uniform in the mirror before leaving the house. As he walked to the fire station, everybody else was going home. Even Mrs. Price was closing a store for the evening. At the fire station, Sam checked in with Station Officer Steele, who had been in charge of the day watch. On time as usual, Sam, he said, yawning. <sighs> Good show. The fire brigade must be ready for emergencies at all times, day and night. Then, leaving Sam in charge, Steele went home. Mess officer Elvis Cridlington had also finished work for the day. I've left a little something for you in a pan on the stove in case you get hungry during the night, he said. Why, well, uh, um, thank you, Elvis, said Sam weakly. Whenever Elvis left something in the pan, it was usually because it refused to come out. After Station Officer Steele and Elvis Cridlington had gone, Sam was all alone in the fire station. His night watch had begun. He checked Jupiter, the fire engine, to make sure it was ready should he be called out to answer an emergency, and having done that, he went upstairs to wait. Sam waited and waited. The phone didn't ring. The alarm bell didn't go off and nobody rushed in from the street shouting fire. Sam wandered over to the stove to see what Elvis had left. Whatever it was, it was cold and rubbery and a very peculiar color. <whistles> Meanwhile, Trevor Evans was walking home. He had been to the cinema. He reached his front door and put his hand in his pocket to pull out his keys. His pocket was empty. In a panic, he searched all his other pockets. They were empty too. Oh, no, he groaned. I've lost my keys. I'm locked out. Desperately, he tried the door, just in case he'd forgotten to lock it. He hadn't. It was well and truly locked. I know, he said. Perhaps I can climb in through a window. But all the big front windows were locked, too. Trevor sat down on the doorstep and sighed. He sat and he thought. And he had an idea. Of course, he cried. The pantry window. Now that has never shut properly. Trevor rushed round the side of the house and sure enough the little window was ajar. 
It's a tight squeeze, he gasped as he squirmed and wriggled in through the open window. Then quite suddenly, he couldn't move at all. Not forwards, not backwards. He huffed and he puffed. He pushed and he pulled. He kicked, he struggled and he strained. But he couldn't move an inch. He stopped to catch his breath. It's no good, he gasped. I'm stuck. Across the road, Mrs. Price was putting out the milk bottles before going to bed. As she did, she looked up and saw Trevor's legs sticking out of his pantry window, kicking and thrashing about. Mrs. Price went as white as a sheet. Eek! She shrieked. It's a burglar! Mrs. Price phoned the police from the phone box by her store. When the policeman arrived, he went over to Trevor's house with his torch. Hello, hello. What's all this then? He said, addressing the pair of legs that were sticking out of Trevor's pantry window. Arrest him! It's a burglar! Squealed Mrs. Price. No, I'm not, said the pair of legs. I'm Trevor Evans and I'm stuck. I lost my keys. Tried to climb in the window, and here I am. The policeman gave Trevor's legs an experimental tug, thought for a minute, and began to talk importantly into his walkie-talkie. Across town, at Ponty Pandy Fire Station, the phone rang. Sam answered it. An emergency? Where? I'll be there right away, he said. Sam sprang into action. He slid down the pole, threw open the huge fire station doors, and climbed into the cab of Jupiter, the fire engine. The engine roared into life, and Sam drove Jupiter out into the night, its blue light flashing brightly. He raced through the quiet, lamplit streets of Ponty Pandy, under the viaduct, and around the corner by Mrs. Price's store. It wasn't long before he reached the street where Trevor lived. When he hears the fire bell chime, Fireman Sam is there on time. Putting on his coat and hat, in less than seven seconds flat. He's always on the scene, Fireman Sam, and his engine's bright and clean. Fireman Sam, you cannot ignore. With the arrival of Sam and Jupiter, it became quite busy outside Trevor's house. Bella, the Italian lady who owned the cafe, had come out to see what was going on. Mrs. Price was talking non-stop, and the policeman was solemnly taking notes in his notebook. Then, of course, there was Trevor. This is really embarrassing said Trevor when the policeman took Sam round to the pantry window. I don't usually do this sort of thing. Don't worry, Trevor, said Sam confidently. We'll have you out of there in a jiffy. Sam looked at the policeman and nodded. One, two, three, pull, said Sam. And he and the policeman took a leg each and pulled. Ow! Out! cried Trevor. Stop! Stop! We could try pushing, said the policeman. So they tried pushing. Ow! Out! cried Trevor. Stop! Don't! Sam and the policeman tried pulling again. He's moving, cried Sam. Sam fell backwards. Whoops, he said. False alarm. I pulled his shoe off. Mrs. Price had wandered up to see what was happening and had to duck as the shoe flew over her head. Well, I never, she exclaimed. Meanwhile, 
Jupiter's blue flashing light had woken Sarah and James. They got up and peered out of the bedroom window. Look, cried Sarah. It's Uncle Sam. I wonder what's going on, said James. They put on their dressing gowns and went downstairs to find out. They saw naughty Norman Price, who would also come out to see what was happening. Luckily, he thought the sight of poor Trevor stuck in the window was so funny that he was giggling too much to cause any mischief. Sarah and James caught sight of Sam and ran over to him. It would be easier if somebody could push Trevor from the other side while somebody pulled from this, Sam explained to the children. But we can't get into the house. Sam thought for a minute. I suppose I could always break down the door. Oh, no, you don't, cried Trevor. I only had it painted last week. Sam went round to the front door just to see if there was any way in at all. He looked at the keyhole, the door knocker, the letterbox. Are you going to chop it down? asked Norman excitedly. I hope not, said Sam, peering through the letterbox. As he peered, Sam smiled a broad smile. Aha, he said in a triumphant kind of way. There, sitting on a table in the hallway, were Trevor's keys. So he hadn't lost them after all. He'd just forgotten them when he went out. That made things a lot easier. Sam went over to Jupiter and started rummaging around in one of the fire engine's lockers. He was looking for something. Something in particular. He rummaged around a little more, finally pulling out a very odd contraption indeed. Aha, he said again. My extra extending gadget grabbers. Sam stuck one end of the contraption through the letterbox and pressed the handles together. It stretched across the hallway like a pair of extra long arms. He twiddled the dial and it picked the keys up. Pulling the handles apart again, the contraption shrank back towards the letterbox. Carefully, he pulled the contraption out and took the keys. He opened Trevor's front door and went inside. Putting the gadget grabbers down on the hall table, he walked on through to the pantry. He opened the door and switched on the light. Trevor! cried Sam in horror. There he was, stuck in the window frame and munching away on a packet of biscuits. Sam! exclaimed Trevor, trying to hide the biscuits. No wonder we couldn't get you out. You've been stuffing yourself with biscuits all the time, laughed Sam. I was feeling a little peckish, explained Trevor weakly. <whistles> Sam called to the policeman and asked if he was ready. He was. Right, Trevor, explained Sam. This is it. Now, when I say go, you must breathe out and pull your tummy in. I'm going to push and the policeman's going to pull. You'll be out in no time. Trevor didn't seem too sure. Go, cried Sam. Trevor breathed out and pulled his tummy in. Sam and the policeman pushed and pulled. They jiggled and they jostled. They tried it in little bursts. They tried it in long ones. There were all sorts of grunts and groans and cries of, He's moving! And... No, he isn't, and nearly there. Then all of a sudden, almost without warning, there was a loud pop, like a cork being pulled from a bottle. One moment, Trevor was in the window. The next, he was sitting on top of the policeman. Everybody cheered. Bella came over with some hot tea and biscuits. Lovely, said Sam taking a cup of tea and a biscuit. Thank you kindly, madam, said the policeman, taking a cup of tea and a biscuit. Um, 
I've gone off biscuits, said Trevor, just taking a cup of tea. Sam laughed. After his tea, Sam packed his gadget grabbers away. Everybody drifted back indoors now that the excitement was over and went to bed. The policeman went off to fill in his reports, and after saying good night to Trevor, Sam drove back to the fire station. After all, he was still on night watch. Sam stayed on duty all night, and at half past seven in the morning, station officer Steele turned up for work. He was taking the day watch. Quiet night? he asked. Oh, so so, replied Sam. You're never stuck for anything to do being a fireman. When he got home, Sam went straight to bed. Then he got up again. He had forgotten to set the alarm clock. That would never do, he said, setting it and climbing back into bed. After all, I have to get up at five o'clock in the afternoon. I'm on night watch again tonight. When Sam smells a rat. It was the start of another day in Pontypandy. The sun was shining, the sky was clear and bright, and all the birds were singing. Fireman Sam got up and threw open the windows. Ah, he said, taking a deep breath. There's nothing like the smell of fresh air to wake you up in the morning. Sam got ready for work, checked that all his buttons were shiny, and that his hat was at a jaunty angle, and set off for the fire station. As it was such a nice morning, he decided to set off earlier than usual and take a short stroll through the park. Being early, it was nice and peaceful in the park, and Sam quite enjoyed his stroll. He stopped by the flower beds for a moment to smell the flowers. He liked the flowers and wished he could stay longer, but he had to get to the fire station. On his way down the street, he passed Bella's Cafe. Even though it wasn't open yet, he could smell the aroma of freshly baked cakes. His mouth watered just thinking about them, and he was sorry to leave the smell behind as he walked on. Station officer Steele was also on his way to the fire station, but he didn't feel as happy as Sam. You see, he had a cold, and it made him feel miserable. His nose was all blocked up, and he had to keep stopping to blow it. I can't smell anything, he moaned. I can't even smell my prize roses. This made him feel more miserable than ever, because he liked to smell them every day. Mind you, it also meant that he couldn't smell the pile of manure nearby that he was going to spread on the roses to help them grow. When station officer Steele and Sam arrived at the fire station, they met Elvis Cridlington, who was carrying a book. What do you read in? asked Sam. It's a, it's a cookbook, said Elvis proudly, full of exotic and foreign recipes. I thought I might try one today. It'll make a change. 
Anything will make a change if it's edible, grumbled Steele. So, Elvis went into the kitchen with his cookbook, Steele went into his office with his cold, and Sam... Well, Sam was thinking. The more he thought about Elvis and his exotic recipes, the more he thought about going to Bella's Cafe for lunch and about the mouth-watering smell that had wafted from her kitchen. <coughs> Meanwhile, at Mrs. Price's store, a package had arrived for her son, Norman. At last, he said mysteriously. Making sure he was alone, he tore off the brown wrapping paper to reveal a small cardboard box. He opened it. It's my stink bombs, he exclaimed gleefully, and smiled a mischievous smile. Norman wondered what to do with them. Well, he knew what to do with them. It was just a case of where. A moment later, Norman chuckled to himself. I know just the place, he said, scampering up the street towards the fire station. At the fire station, it had been a fairly quiet morning. Sam was snoozing, Steele was sneezing, and Elvis was doing his best with the exotic cooking. Naughty Norman crept into the station, and when he saw that there was nobody about, he let off one of his stink bombs by Jupiter's front tire. Norman ran off to watch from a safe distance. The stench from the stink bomb spread through the fire station, floating silently upstairs to where Sam was dreaming about Bella's cooking. Sam sniffed and awoke with a start. His nose wrinkled up. Oh, what's that awful smell? Elvis, have you burnt the lunch again? He called. No, I haven't said Elvis indignantly. There's nothing wrong with... Oh! What's that smell? They called station officer Steele, but he was next to useless. He couldn't smell a thing because of his cold. I think it's coming from downstairs, said Sam. He slid down the pool. Sure enough, the smell was stronger. Sam threw open the big fire station doors and opened all the windows. The awful smell soon began to disappear. Ah, that's better, sighed Sam. Nice, fresh air. It was then that he spotted the remains of the stink bomb. Hmm, he said thoughtfully. Norman crept away, sniggering. Norman crept around town all morning, letting off stink bombs and annoying people. Later, he boarded Trevor Evans' bus. Sarah and James, Fireman Sam's niece and nephew, were also aboard. Norman sat at the back of the bus, seeming very innocent. He waited until nobody was looking. Then he let off a stink bomb. Oh, what's that smell? he said, pretending he didn't know what it was. Oh, it's awful, squealed Sarah. They went up to the front of the bus to get away from the smell, but it followed them. Goodness, cried Trevor when he smelt it. What's that? <whistles> Trevor ushered the children out of the door, opened all the windows and got off the bus. They all had to sit by the side of the road and wait for the smell to disappear before they could get back on the bus and continue their journey. Norman was trying very hard not to laugh. When most of the smell had gone, everybody climbed back on board, taking care to leave the windows open. The bus came round by the park, and naughty Norman got off and scurried away. Sarah and James thanked Trevor for the ride and went over to Bella's cafe. The smell still lingered in the bus, so Trevor called into Mrs. Price's store for something to disguise it. 
he picked up a can of air freshener. You know, it's a funny thing, said Mrs. Price. I've been doing a roaring trade in air fresheners today. Suddenly, everybody wants air fresheners. Can you imagine? Trevor said he could. When he hears the firebell chime, Fireman Sam is there on time. Putting on his coat and hat, in less than seven seconds flat. He's always on the scene, Fireman Sam, and his engine's bright and clean. Fireman Sam, you cannot ignore. Sam is the hero next door. Meanwhile, Sarah and James were in Bella's cafe. They took a long time to choose what they wanted from the menu, while Bella waited patiently. Well, what do you have? She asked finally. We have two ice cream sodas and two cream cakes, please, said James. While Sarah and James sat down at one of the tables, Bella pottered around in the kitchen. It was there that she smelt a funny smell. She switched the cooker off and looked in the oven. This is certainly not of my cakes, she said. But she couldn't think what else it could be. And the smell was getting stronger. Bella went back into the cafe. Sarah, James, she said. There's a funny smell in my kitchen. Will you go and fetch your Uncle Sam for me? Maybe he will know what it is. Sarah and James could see that she looked worried, so they hurried off at once. Sarah and James ran up the road to the fire station. Uncle Sam, they cried, you must come quickly. Bella says she can smell something funny in a kitchen. Aha, said Sam, thinking back to the stink bomb he found. So the stink bomb phantom is at it again, is he? Fireman Sam pressed the alarm button. The bells rang, and Elvis and Station Officer Steele came sliding down the pool. They were in such a hurry that Elvis almost forgot he was still wearing his kitchen apron. Come on, said Sam. Bella's got a smelly problem down at the cafe. They all climbed into the fire engine, and with the bells ringing, they raced through the streets to Bella's cafe. When they got there, Bella was standing outside on the pavement, still looking worried. What's the matter, Bella? asked Sam. It's uh, the smell. It's getting so bad. She replied. Sam poked his head round the cafe door gingerly and took a gentle sniff. His nose twitched as he tried to identify the smell. He soon realized that it wasn't a stink bomb. It was something else. He went back and had a quiet word with Station Officer Steele. Everybody back now! said Steele, importantly, making sure they stayed away from the cafe. We've got a gas leak. Sam had opened one of Jupiter's lockers and was putting on a fireman's gas mask. God, a mia! exclaimed Bella when she saw him. Don't worry, Bella, said Steele. Sam will sort it out. Sam entered the cafe in his gas mask carrying a bag of special tools. He walked behind the counter and into the kitchen beyond. He looked around, trying to find out where the leak was coming from. He heard a hissing sound coming from near the cooker. Sam knelt down by the cooker, and sure enough, he found the gas leak. The gas pipe that was connected to the cooker had a faulty valve. He put his special tool back down and rummaged around in it. Who'll have this fixed? He said through his gas mask. Sam pulled tools out of his bag. He twiddled and he tightened. He banged and he clanged. 
he twisted and he turned, and soon he was satisfied. There, it's fixed. It's as good as new now. It won't leak gas again. And he packed his tools away and went to tell Bella the good news. <phone rings> Meanwhile, around the corner at the general store, Mrs. Price watched the fire engine outside Bella's. Goodness, whatever's going on? She asked herself. There were people standing round on the pavement and she couldn't see much from her shop door, so she wandered over to see what all the fuss was about. Oh dear, what's happening, Bella? Asked Mrs. Price when she crossed the road. They tell me I have a gas leak, sniffed Bella. Fireman Sam has gone in to fix it. He should uh, be out any minute. Mrs. Price craned her neck to see. Was that Sam coming out of the door now? Sam, in his gas mask, almost bumped into Mrs. Price when he came out. The sudden, unexpected sight of Sam in his mask frightened her. Ah! She screamed. It was difficult to tell who was the most startled. But it must have been Mrs. Price, because she fainted. Luckily, Sam caught her. Steele grabbed the first aid box from the fire engine. These smelling salts will bring her round, he said, waving a small bottle under her nose. Sam took his gas mask off, so as not to give her another fright. It's her own fault, laughed Steele. She shouldn't be so nosy. Oh, what happened? asked Mrs. Price weakly when she opened her eyes. You fainted, said Steele. I remember, she said. Something black and horrible. That was my gas mask, laughed Sam, holding it up for her to see. Mrs. Price did feel silly and she went bright red with embarrassment. While all this had been going on, Naughty Norman had been watching from his hiding place in the park. All those people, he chortled. That's just the place to let off my last stink bomb. He wandered over as innocently as he could and took out his little cardboard box. Hello, what's going on here? boomed station officer Steele, walking up behind Norman and making him jump. So you're the culprit behind the foul smell in the fire station, are you? Just be thankful I couldn't smell it with my coat. And with that, he marched Norman off to his mother. Steele told Mrs. Price all about her son's antics and showed her the remaining stink bomb. Norman stood there looking very guilty, while his mother scolded him. Whatever will I do with you, Norman Price? She said. If you'll pardon me, said Steele, I can think of just the thing. They went round to Steele's house. There, he said, pointing to the pile of manure. I want that lot spreading on my roses. But it smells awful, squealed Norman. Then wear a peg on your nose, said Steele. So Norman did. And funnily enough, he never used stink bombs again. When he is the firebell giant, fireman Sam is there on time. Sam's Night Watch. Sarah and James turn the page. When he is the firebell giant, fireman Sam is there on time. Putting on his coat and hat, in less than seven seconds flat. He's always on the scene, fireman Sam, and his engine's bright and clean, fireman
Sam's Rabbit Rescue. Fireman Sam had been inside his inventing shed for three solid days. I wonder what Uncle Sam can be inventing this time, said Sarah, who was standing outside the shed with her brother James. I don't know, replied James, but whatever it is, it's sure to mean trouble. What do you mean, James? asked Sarah. Don't tell me you've forgotten about the automatic door closer, said James. Do you mean the one that opened the door so hard that it flew off its hinges? asked Sarah. That's the one, agreed her brother. Oh dear, sighed Sarah, looking at the locked door. Then this invention certainly means trouble for someone, and that someone is bound to be us. Suddenly the shed door flew open to reveal Fireman Sam. It's finished, he announced importantly. Sarah and James went inside the shed with their Uncle Sam. There was a tall object covered by a sheet standing on a table in the middle of the room. What is it this time, Uncle Sam? asked Sarah suspiciously. <whistles> Fireman Sam smiled and stepped over to the covered object. I know, he began, that in the past I may have developed a few inventions that were perhaps just a little bit impractical. Yes, interrupted James, like the cake mixer that went mad and demolished the kitchen, and the toy dog that bit my leg, added Sarah. As I was saying, Fireman Sam went on, some of my inventions were a little useless, asked Sarah. Fireman Sam was not put out in the least by these interruptions. But this is my masterpiece, he said, as he whipped off the sheet dramatically. The two children gazed in awe at the magnificent machine that was revealed. What is it, Uncle Sam? asked James. This, said Sam importantly, is my supersonic microbionic electronic turbo powered a grade first class outboard motorboard engine now help me get it outside so we can test it sam and the two children heaved the invention out into the garden and stood it up in its special supporting frame there are just two problems here uncle sam said james one is that there is no lake anywhere near Pontypandy big enough for a supersonic, microbionic, electronic, turbo-powered, A-grade, first-class outboard motorboat engine. And the other problem is... Yes? asked Sam. You don't have a boat. Oh, no! exclaimed Sam, clapping his hands to his forehead in dismay. I never thought of that. He stuck his hands in his pockets and stood looking sadly at the invention. Never mind, Uncle Sam, said Sarah sympathetically. Maybe it will come in handy for something else. That's it, shouted Sam excitedly, and I know exactly what it will be. He rushed into the inventing shed and then rushed back out again with an armful of tools. Here we go, he said as he pulled out a giant spanner and got to work on the invention. Sarah and James watched with interest as their uncle worked frantically on the machine. There, said Sam at last. Just two more turns on the bindle spline, and that will be it. Sam had removed the propeller from the outboard motor and fitted an extremely large corkscrew in its place. Allow me to present my new, new invention. The Fireman Sam Super Special Telegraph Pole Hole Digger. Sam explained how it would work. Instead of the post office telegraph pole person digging the hole slowly with a shovel, he will simply hold these handles, press that button, and the engine starts, the corkscrew turns, and bingo, the hole is Doug. Are you sure it will work, Uncle Sam? asked Sarah doubtfully. 
Of course it will, replied her uncle confidently. In fact, we will take it out for a trial right now. They put the pole hole digger into a wheelbarrow and pushed it all the way up Pandy Lane until they came to Ponty Pandy Common. This will do nicely, said Fireman Sam, coming to a stop in the middle of the green field. Give me a hand to get it into position, James, gasped Sam as he struggled to hold the machine upright. Now, Sarah, he went on, move the wheelbarrow. Sarah was quite glad of an excuse to get well away in case anything went wrong and quickly pushed the barrow out of range. When Sam had the digger nicely balanced and James had joined his sister well out of harm's way, he took a good grip on the handles, placed his thumb over the red button, pressed it firmly and disappeared. The awesome power of the supersonic, microbionic, electronic, turbo-powered, A-grade, first-class motorized pole hole digger had been too much for Sam to handle. And at that very moment, he was being dragged behind the digger, deep underground, as the machine went out of control. Finally, the digger shot up out of the ground, with Sam still clinging desperately to the handles. He did a slow curve through the air and then hit the ground again, only to disappear once more on another subterranean journey. Sarah and James watched with interest as their uncle kept popping up out of the ground and then disappearing again. I suppose he will run out to petrol quite soon, said Sarah, as Sam did a spectacular double flip before disappearing yet again. Probably, agreed James, but he was wrong. The pole hole digger didn't run out of petrol. It exploded just as it reached the peak of a particularly high leap. We were lucky there, said James to his uncle as he pushed him along Pandy Lane in the wheelbarrow. Lucky, groaned the feeble fireman. Yes, very lucky, said James. If the digger had exploded underground, Sarah and I would have had to dig you out. Oh, yes, we were very lucky moaned Sam, settling back in the barrow and closing his eyes. Very lucky indeed. Back at the fire station, Sam soon recovered from his ordeal and was ready for duty. he just finished a cup of tea when the telephone rang. Sam picked it up. Hello, he said. Help! It was Bella, the nice Italian lady who owned the cafe in the high street. What's the trouble, Bella? asked Fireman Sam. It's a horrible, wailed Bella. I'm being invaded by jumping pussycats. Jumping pussycats? asked the puzzled fireman. Station Officer Steele, Sarah and James looked at each other. Jumping pussycats? they all said in amazement. Sarah, James, and the fearless firefighters climbed aboard Jupiter, the fire engine, and roared out of the fire station. They sped through the streets of Ponty Pandy and came to a screeching halt in front of Bella's cafe. They jumped out of Jupiter and rushed into the cafe. An amazing sight met their eyes. Rabbits. Black rabbits. Brown rabbits, white, grey, and even spotted rabbits. They were everywhere. In things, on things, behind things, and under things. Bella was sitting on the edge of the counter holding a rabbit in each arm. See, she said, jumping a pussycats. They're not pussycats, 
said Station Officer Steele. They're rabbits. I am no, said Bella. But I can't say rabbits in English. But then, a scream was heard. That sounds like Mrs. Price, said Sam. They all rushed into the street and saw Mrs. Price standing in front of the general store, surrounded by rabbits. She screamed again. Help! Save me! Ooh! Help! Calm down, Mrs. Price, said Station Officer Steele soothingly. They're only rabbits. Only rabbits? Screeched Mrs. Price. They're horrible! Take them away! Sam looked inside the store. The rabbits were everywhere. And most of them were munching their way through Mrs. Price's vegetables. Where can they have come from? James wondered, as more and more rabbits filled the streets of Pontypandy. At that moment, Trevor Evans came driving carefully along the high street. Trevor leaned out of the minibus window and shouted to Sam and his friends. I've just come down from Pandy Moor, he yelled. The construction company has laid the new motorway right across the old rabbit warrens. The rabbits just managed to get out before the burrows were sealed completely. Oh, no, exclaimed Sarah. That means the rabbits have no homes. Well, they can't stay here, snapped Mrs. Price, as another lettuce leaf disappeared down the throat of a munching bunny. No, they can't, added Station Officer Steele, doing a very good tap dance as a baby rabbit clung to his trouser leg. Why don't we take them to the common, suggested James, and let them live in the holes you dug with the power-driven pole hole digger? Everyone thought this was a good idea, but the problem was, how do you persuade 10,000 bunnies to go where you want them to? They tried everything, but the rabbits just would not leave Ponty Pandy. Then Trevor Evans had an idea. Carrot juice, he shouted. The others looked at him in surprise. Carrot juice? They echoed. Yes, said Trevor. We lay a trail of carrot juice and the rabbits will follow it. Bella brought a liquidizer and a huge bowl from the cafe and Mrs. Price carried out two sacks of carrots. In no time at all, with everyone lending a hand, the carrots were crushed into a juicy pulp. Station Officer Steele poured the carrot juice into Jupiter's storage tank. Then Fireman Sam drove slowly to the common, while Steele carefully squirted the carrot juice from the hose onto the road as they went. It's working, cried James, as the thousands of rabbits sniffed their way to Ponty Pandy Common. As soon as the rabbits reached the common, they dived straight into the holes and disappeared. They seem to like their new homes, said Sam with a smile. And they did. Except, that is, for two small brown bunnies who had decided to make their home in the left leg of Station Officer Steele's trousers. When he 